The subcommittee will come to order, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. And welcome to our hearing this morning, afternoon, I should say. Lawyer Shi Yang was tortured for the better part of two years because he dared to represent China's poor and persecuted. The account of his detention is both harrowing and horrible. Shi Yang was sleep deprived and kept in isolation. Squads of police punched and kicked him for hours at a time. He was forced to sit for hours on a precarious stack of plastic chairs, his feet dangling painfully off the ground. Police made threats to his wife and children and said that they would turn him into an invalid unless he confessed to political crimes. Xi Yang and his fellow human rights lawyers wanted the best for China, but what they got was the very worst. Since July of 2015, almost 250 lawyers and legal assistants were detained, sending a chilling message to those fighting for legal reforms and for elemental human rights. We are here today to shine a bright light on the brutal, illegal, and dehumanizing use of torture and forced disappearance of human rights lawyers and rights advocates in China. We shine a light on dictatorships because nothing good happens in the dark. And as we will learn today, there are some very, very dark places in China. Chinese officials repeatedly tell us and they tell me all the time that I should focus more on the positive aspects of China and not dwell so much on the negative. That is a difficult task when you read Xi Yang's story or read Gao Zhejiang's account of his torture and his wife and his daughter previously have testified before our subcommittee or read the account of many other very, very brave uh, women and men who are standing up for human rights in China. It's a difficult task when you look at Li Chungfu and his brother Li Heping. These are some of China's best and bravest and brightest, and now women and men with broken bodies, shattered minds, broken noses and faces, men and women who have aged 20 or more years after just two years of, or three of solitary confinement or torture. It is shocking, offensive, immoral, barbaric and inhumane. It is also completely possible that Chinese officials believe the international community will not hold them to account. While President Xi Jinping feels feted at Davos and lauded in national capitals for his public commitments to openness, his government is torturing and abusing those seeking rights guaranteed by China's own constitution and, of course, its international obligations. One Oxford University scholar said that Xi Jinping has built the, quote, perfect dictatorship an increasingly repressive garrison state that avoids any international censure. Through the United Nations and the sanctions available in the Global Magnitsky Act, however, we should be seeking to hold accountable any Chinese officials complicit in torture, human rights abuses, and illegal detentions. Xi Yang identified at least 10 police officers who tortured him. We have a list of those officers uh, who he has named they need to be investigated by the administration and sanctions meted out individually to these individuals who have visited such horror and cruelty upon him. We are in the process of gathering names of others as well. I, as chairman of this committee, will send those names to President Trump, Secretary of State Tillerson, U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and the chairs and ranking members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, pursuant again to the the, uh, the Magnitsky Act uh, protocol. We will seek UN investigations into the torture of Chinese human rights lawyers and human rights defenders. You know, as we all know, on several occasions, the Special Rapporteur for Torture has looked into the use of torture in China and has found it to be absolutely systematic. If you're arrested and you're a religious prisoner or you're a political prisoner, a prisoner of conscience, you will be tortured and you will be tortured with depravity and with utter cruelty. We know that this also violates China's obligations as a signatory to the UN Torture Convention. Where's the enforcement? We will also seek investigations under Global Magnitsky Act, as I said. I introduced the House version of that bill, which was signed into law last year. That law explicitly, and it says explicitly, that any foreign government officials who engages in or is complicit in torture 
can be sanctioned by denying entry visas into the United States or by imposing financial uh, sanctions. Those who tortured Xi Yang and Li Heping should never benefit from access to the United States or to our financial system. We will hear testimony today from some of the wives uh, who have suffered. You know, when a political or prisoner of conscience is sent off to jail and suffers, it's not just that dissident who suffers. It is the wives, the families, the extended families. Very often, they're rounded up as well and interrogated and beaten. You know, we have the great Chen Quan Jen in our audience today and his wife, Wei Jing. Uh, when Chen suffered the barbarity of the Chinese dictatorship for speaking up on behalf of women who have been coerced into forced abortions in Ling Yi, he suffered in prison, then under house imprisonment, but his wife and his children also suffered uh, and showed incredible bravery during that entire uh, terrible ordeal. But he persevered, he persisted, and today is now free and speaks out uh, very boldly and effectively on behalf of human rights abuses in China. Pastor Bob Fu, who will be doing much of the translation today, or some of the translation, he too was incarcerated uh, as a prisoner of conscience. But again, he persisted along with his wife as well uh, and found their way to freedom uh, and now speaks out boldly as part of, uh, as leader of China Aid. Finally, we'll hear from uh, uh, many fear that Mr. Li and Li uh, Ming Zi, uh, his wife, uh, will also be providing testimony to us today. After ending main mainland China in March of, of this year for a personal trip, Mr. Li went missing for 10 days before the Chinese officials confirmed that he was being held on so-called national security grounds. Let me just say, we all know this. What a joke. People ask for human rights, protections, and they're accused of national security violations. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it just, it just doesn't pass the straight face test, and it's about time that subterfuge and that, that lie, that big lie, was fully uh, done away with and exposed. Many fear that Mr. Li is being detained under a harsh new Chinese law to monitor and control foreign-funded NGOs, enforced earlier this year as part of a crackdown on civil society. As some of you may know, I also chair the China Commission, along with Marco Rubio, and every year we put out a very extensive uh, account of the human rights abuse in China. One of the big changes, worsening changes, there are many, uh, is the fact that the NGOs are now being, uh, who had very limited freedom to begin with, have far less now just as religious uh, organizations and denominations are also being cracked down uh, by, the, by this uh, cruel dictatorship. Politically, uh, let me just conclude um, uh, by saying that we will, we welcome the testimony of these wives. Um, I hope and I pray and we will monitor to ensure that because they have spoken out boldly and, and in an open forum like today, that any further retaliation against their husbands or any members of their families will be watched closely. Uh, and Xi Jinping uh, will be noticed, and I do hope the Trump administration will be bold and effective, as, as well as Secretary Tillerson, uh, in raising individual cases, because when you raise the, raise the individual cases, obviously it helps all the others as well. I yield to Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman, for your remarks and for your leadership on human rights issues worldwide. Ranking Member Bass is unable to join us here today. Um, I'm not the superstar that she is, uh, but I'm glad that she's allowed me to be the ranking member this afternoon in her absence. Let there be no doubt that the United States will marshal its political and economic might for the cause of human rights around the world, and that we will ask the same of our allies as we move further into the digital age, information is more accessible than ever, which means that the suffering and harm to people is also more visible than ever. The United States and nations around the world cannot turn away from what we see, and we must take action. The tenure of Chinese President Xi Jinping has been accompanied by an increasingly harsh crackdown on any individuals and groups deemed to be subverting state power. The passage of the law on the management of foreign NGO activities raises serious concerns. According to the 2016 State Department report on human rights, the Chinese law describes foreign NGOs as, quote, national security threats and requires all NGOs to undergo a difficult registration process. 
In doing so, the Chinese government has greatly restricted the political space of its civil society. Chinese environment, environmental activists, ethnic minorities, religious leaders, and political dissidents, among others, are routinely arrested and given years-long prison sentences, often for actions as trivial as posting a comment online. And the lawyers representing these individuals often suffer equally severe treatment. Chinese human rights lawyers are routinely harassed by the Chinese security apparatus, detained for extended periods of time, tortured, charged with crimes, and sentenced to lengthy prison terms. Last month, President Trump met with President Xi where they discussed economic and political issues. The meeting came at a time when China's crackdown on human rights reached new heights. While President Trump raised the issue of human rights with President Xi, Secretary, Secretary Tillerson dismissed the idea of discussing human rights in a separate dialogue. The Secretary instead stated that U.S. core values of human rights would be part of U.S. economic or political dialogue with China. Yet, Secretary Tillerson was the first Secretary of State who did not attend the annual release of the State Department's Human Rights Report since the mid-1990s. We here in Congress will pay close attention to the actions of the administration and ensure they follow through on U.S. commitments to advancing the cause of human rights in China and in nations around the world. Today, we will hear from four brave women who continue to show their courage by testifying in front of the United States Congress. Each of their husbands has endured unjust imprisonment and inhumane treatment under dubious circumstances. They deserve our appreciation for taking great risks by providing firsthand accounts of China's increasingly restrictive political environment. The perseverance of our witnesses and their families is a reminder that the fight for just and accountable government is a cause worth fighting for. It's also a reminder that progress towards a free and fair society is fragile and must be pursued every day. And of course, being a member of Congress from Texas, I want to acknowledge that one of our witnesses has been residing there after narrowly escaping Chinese authorities in Thailand, Ms. Chen made her way to my home state. We're happy to have you here, Ms. Chen. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your stories and your family stories with us today. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Castro. I'd like to introduce our distinguished witnesses and again thank them for, thank you for your bravery and courage in coming forward. We'll begin first with uh, Chen Gui Chu, who is the wife of Christian human rights attorney Shi Yang. Shi Yan focused his professional life on helping those victimized by the communist regime's forced demolitions and migrations, as well as impoverished people whose rights were trampled by, on by the Chinese government. Because of his work, he was taken away on July 11, 2015, as part of Xi Jinping's nationwide crackdown on human rights defenders. I mentioned some of the horrific ordeal that he has endured uh, in my opening. Uh, and we will hear from his wife uh, very uh, shortly. We'll then hear from Wang Yafan, who is the wife of Tan Ji Ling, uh, who is a human rights lawyer whose clients have included villagers fighting government corruption and victims of illegal land appropriation. In 2006, uh, Tang's license to practice law in China was suspended, after which he became involved in a nonviolent civil disobedience movement in China. In 2012, he was detained for five days following his work investigating the death of a human rights defender. In 2014, uh, Mr. Tong was detained on suspicion of inciting subversion of state power in the weeks leading up to the 25th anniversary of the Chinese government violent crackdown of the, in Tiananmen Square. He was tried in July of 2015 along with two other prominent political advocates. Uh, and Ms. Wang is currently staying in the U.S. while she advocates for her husband's release. We'll then hear from Jin Bai Ling, wife of John T. Young. John T. Young is a veteran human rights lawyer who has worked on prominent cases, including those of Chen Quanzhen and Gao Zhejiang. He has also worked on cases advocating for the rights of AIDS and hepatitis B infected people, as well as other human rights and humanitarian cases. From 2009 to 2012, Chinese officials harassed, kidnapped, and physically tortured uh, uh, Tung, and on numerous occasions for his human rights work. In November, he traveled to Hunan to pay a visit uh, to Chen Gui Chu, 
the wife of the imprisoned human rights lawyer, who will speak momentarily. He was kidnapped while returning to Beijing on November 21st and placed under residential surveillance for alleged subversion of state power. Uh, he is now being held. Finally, we'll hear from, or we will hear from Li Jing Yu, uh, the wife of detained Taiwan community college worker uh, Li Ming Zi. Ms. Li graduated from the Department of Labor Relations at the Chinese Culture University in Taiwan, where she and her husband met and began to uh, participate in social movements. Uh, before 2014, Ms. Mr. Li began discussing Taiwan's historical experiences and issues of transitional justice with a group of Chinese friends through the instant messaging app WeChat. In 2015, Mr. Li's WeChat account was blocked from using the group's chat feature, and Mr. Li began proactively seeking books as gifts to his Chinese contacts who were arrested in human rights and or modern history. Around 2016, February, he was called on friends uh, through WeChat to raise funds for the family of a Chinese civil rights activist. Later that year, in August 2016, books he sent to Chinese friends were confiscated. He went missing um, as he was entering the Chinese uh, China from the city of Macau in, on March 19, 2017, so that's just a few weeks ago. Ten days later, after his forced abduction, uh, the Taiwan, Taiwan Affairs uh, Office admitted he was in custody, and that um, he, he is, and that's why we are here today to seek uh, his release as well. So we'll begin. Uh, we do have both. How much time? Okay. Um, I think because we do want to hear all of you, um, and uh, Mr. Castro and I will will take a, a brief uh, respite to go vote. But we will then come back, and we look forward to your testimony. And I apologize for that inconvenience. Uh, we stand on recess, subject to the call of the chair. The committee will resume its uh, sitting, and I'd like to uh, yield to uh, Randy. Randy, any comments you might have? I'll be very brief, but uh, just wanted to say thank you for being here. I uh, just am humbled and amazed by your courage, by uh, the, the stands that you're taking, but also the, uh, that your husbands uh, are taking. And it is so important for us to hear your stories, to be able to uh, share that with, with others, but uh, also know this is um, it's, it's hard for us to still even comprehend or wrap our mind around uh, what you're going through and what others like your families are going through. So our hope is meetings like this, hearings like this uh, can um, encourage and push uh, those entities that are doing uh, this, uh, these horrible atrocities to stop, to free your husbands, and to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else's husband. So thank you for being here. I look forward uh, to hearing more of what we can do and hopefully seeing some positive uh, results in very difficult circumstances. So thank you, Chairman Aylbeck. I thank uh, Chairman Hochtrum for, for coming, but also for his great work that he does as chairman of the Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission. He does wonderful work there, including on human rights abuses in China. So thank you. I'd like to now ask uh, Chen Hui Chu um, if you could provide your testimony. Honorable Chairman Chris Smith, Honorable Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organization Representatives, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the wife of human rights lawyer L. Xie Yang. I would like to thank good God, the Trump administration, China Aid Association, and the hardworking diplomats. I also want to express my gratitude toward Representative Chairman Smith as well as other politicians and friends who are concerned with the development of human rights and the judicial system of China. With your help, my two daughters and I escaped from the jaws of death and arrived in the United States, the land of freedom. With your help, 
I'm able to stand here to speak on behalf of the victims in China who do not have a voice. I would like to give you a better idea of human rights conditions in China. And, uh, and uh, next, I will, um, with the help of Bob Fu, um, to help me. Um, what, uh, what, I would like to ask the to the to the to the so I have a request uh, to the chairman that um, uh, to submit the torture record uh, of my husband and also my husband's um, uh, declaration on January 13th, uh, 2017 about uh, his uh, torture uh, as a part of the uh, congressional record. Uh, without objection, all of those uh, additions will be made a part of the record, and that goes for all of our wives, uh, whatever it is you'd like to become part of the record will be, without objection. Thank you so much. Xie Yang represented, represented uh, dozens of cases on behalf of the uh, downtrodden, including poor Chinese citizens who have had their houses or land size, uh, seized from them without compensation, dissidents, members of China's religious communities, and other marginalized and persecuted groups. Due to his work defending human rights, he was jailed and brutally tortured. After Xiang was arrested by national security agents in Changsha and placed in secret detention for six months, his captors brutally tortured him in an attempt to make him confess and provide evidence against his colleagues. The methods of torture included beatings delivered in rotation by a rooster of guards, exhausting interrogations for over 20 hours at once, having cigarette smoke blown into his face and eyes, starvation, dehydration, and, refusal, and the refusal of medical treatment for his illness. To force him to surrender, his interrogators even threatened to arrange a car accident to injure his wife and children. He was beaten by a prison guard named Yuan Jin, Yuan Jin during his de detention. On November 21st, 2016, his defense lawyer, Zhang Chengshi, visited Xie Yang for the first time and witnessed Yuan Jin beating him while he was waiting. Xie Yang's head swelled up and began to bleed. Yimis, who have been released from his detention center told me that he was not allowed to access money so he could not even buy toothpaste and toilet paper. Not allowed to communicate with others, he was purposely singled out. The guards specifically arranged for criminals sentenced to death to live with Xie Yang so that he would be beaten up and harassed. So the publications of Xie Yang's torture account has had an immediate impact both inside China and internationally, as I just submitted today. Xie Yang's court session was held on May the 8th, 2017. None of the witnesses showed up. None of the defense lawyers I hired showed up. I did not even receive a notice of the court session. Instead, Xie Yang attended the session with an official lawyer appointed by the government. The friends who planned to witness the court session were seized and arrested by the national security agents. Xie Yang was forced to admit his guilt and deny the torture he suffered in the detention center. Regarding the fact that he was not allowed to see his lawyer for 16 months or communicate with the outside world, he was forced to acknowledge that his rights were protected. He was bailed out after the court session, but still had not regained freedom. The national security agents followed him wherever he goes. I strongly hope the Honorable President Trump and the US Congress can immediately and effectively urge China's central government to investigate, investigate the actual facts behind the torture of those arrested in the 709 crackdown, simultaneously enacting legal sanctions against those who practice torture. 
and requests that China clearly ensures that other incarcerated prisoners of conscience do not continue to receive harm. I call on President Trump to conscientiously implement the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, punishing those who have, who have irrefutable evidence of practicing torture and infringing on human rights. I earnestly request that President Trump meet with the family members of the Chinese people who have suffered before he goes to China as he is visiting with them publicly raise his concern for China's worsening religious freedom, rule of law, human rights conditions. I also ask that he publicly give China's leaders a list of prisoners of conscience to free the 709 cases victim, victims, Chen um, Guiqiu. Thank you. Ms. Chen, thank you so very much uh, for your testimony and again, for you and all of the wives for your bravery. We'd like to now uh, ask um, um, Wan Ya Fan, so Ms. Wan. Chen 門對唐金寧和中國人權宗教迫害案件的關注,幫助和支持。Honorable Chairman Smith, Honorable Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights and International Organizations Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen, my name is Wang Yanfang, wife of human rights lawyer Tang Jingling. I'd like to express my gratitude to Representative Chris Smith, Senator Marco Rubio, Representative Nancy Pelosi, Representative Holtgren, and many other representatives, as well as Bob Fu, President of China Aid Association, for your attention and support of my husband and many other victims of human rights abuse in China. 希望国会记录和保存我丈夫唐金宁在狱中写的一个囚徒的人权报告 I'd like to request the committee to archive my husband's report on, on the violation of human rights in Chinese prisons 以下证词由施家代读 The rest of my testimony will be read by Jasmine Shashi as the institution of religious freedom, rule of law, and human rights continues to deteriorate in China, support for the victims from the international community is very valuable and precious. This is also an important milestone in joint endeavors to maintain universal values all over the world. In the past few decades, people of many countries terminated their seemingly powerful and long-lasting autocratic regimes through nonviolent resi resistance and fulfilled the transition from autocracy to democracy. My husband is a well-known human rights lawyer. He is also the initiator and a keen, keen advocate of the civil disobedience movement. He is dedicated to promoting the civil disobedience movement, hoping to bring forth a democratic, democratic and free China. In 1995, the National Security Police began to monitor Tang Jingling after he expressed his lifelong mission to promote democracy in China. In 1999, he published an article on China's democratization in Guangzhou. Then he was forced to leave the big law firm he was working for. As a human rights lawyer, he's been involved in many major cases of human rights abuse, political rights abuse, and workers' rights abuse. For example, in 2003, a petition was initiated to abolish the internment and repatriation regulations and cancel the temporary residence permits policy after college student Sun Ji Gang's death. Tang Jingling served as the legal counsel. 
In 2004, he was the defense lawyer for the two people charged in the Xingang labor unrest case in, Guan, in Dongguan. In January 2005, he defended the newly elected village head in the Shibi Third Villagers campaign to remove old village officials. In August 2005, he was one of the key lawyers in the case of the Taishi villagers' campaign to remove village officials. Due to his involvement in human rights cases, the authorities forced his law firm to terminate his employment and suspended his lawyer's license. In 2006, he planned to attend an event in the U.S., but he was stopped at the customs and his passport was confiscated by the police. He's still not allowed to leave the country to this day. After losing his lawyer license, he participated in many human rights cases as a citizen, including the poisonous Vassin lawsuit, the investigation of Li Wang Yang's death, and many other cases involving land property, forced demolition, and so on. My husband graduated from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 1993. He began to participate in law in 1998. He lost his lawyer license in 2005. Due to his work in human rights protection during the Jasmine Movement in February 2011, he was charged with inciting subversion of state power and was detained in a black jail, where he was threatened and tortured, including extensive sleep deprivation for 10 days in a row. He was allowed to sleep for one to two hours a day after he began to have some dangerous symptoms like trembling all over, numbness in both hands, and heart discomfort until he was released on August 2nd, 2011. He initiated and promoted the civil disobedience movement to seek justice for people at the bottom of the society, but his wife was forced to lose her job in May 2008. During his detention in February 2011, I was, for, I was forcibly brought to Konghua and detained. They took my phone, bruised my arms, and didn't allow me to notify my family and lawyer, which caused my severe depression and poor health. Then the police tricked my mother to go to Guangdong to take care of me, and I was put under house surveillance for a long time. I was not allowed to meet with any family and friends. I was not even allowed to leave my home. More than 20 people took turns watching me. I was completely isolated from the outside world for almost five months. When my husband was released, my physical and mental health had been severely damaged. On May 16, 2014, Tang Jingling was criminally, criminally detained on the charge of picketing quarrels and provoking troubles and was arrested on June 20th with the charge of inciting subversion of state power. On September 23rd, his mother passed away on hearing of his arrest. His lawyer and I applied to bail him out to attend his mother's funeral, but the authorities ignored everything on legal, moral, and humanitarian levels and rejected our request. They didn't notify him of her death until October and caused deep sorrow. The authorities forbade his lawyer to meet with him for six months while his case was being transferred to the pur procuratorate. During the two years in the detention center, all communication was banned. There was no way to guarantee his rights. On January 29, 2016, he was sentenced to five years imprisonment with the charge of inciting subversion of state power. He's serving the sentence in Huiji Prison. Guangdong province. Since he was arrested in August 2013, I was put under 24-hour surveillance, which brought huge emotional pressure and fear to me. However, I've been appealing for my husband and request the release of him. On July 1st, 2014, I went to Hong Kong to attend a demonstration and appealed in the media to urge people to pay attention to Tang Jingling and other prisoners of conscience like Yuan Chaoyang and Wang Qingying. I was threatened by the police after returning to Guangdong, and my freedom was restricted during the so-called sensitive period. 
after the massive arrest of human rights lawyers on July 9th, 2015, I got in touch with families of arrested human rights lawyers and went to the Supreme People's Procuratorate with them. In August, I was not allowed to leave home. Since Tang Jingling worked as a lawyer more than a decade ago, he participated in many human rights cases and promoted civil disobedience movement. Consequently, he lost his lawyer license. He was detained, monitored, arrested, tortured, and sentenced. And his wife lost her job, was harassed, summoned, monitored, and detained. Today, other 709 case lawyers are still suffering from such torture. Many prisoners of conscience are still unable to meet with their lawyers and families. Christian churches are, and Christian churches are still being shut down. Christians are still being detained and sentenced. Thus, I sincerely plead with President Trump and the U.S. Congress to urge the Chinese government to guarantee Tang Jingling's right to meet with his lawyer and his right to reading, communication, medical treatment, and food with enough nutrition, as well as ensure that Tang Jingling, Wang Quan Zhang, Zhang Tianyong, Wu Guan, Yuan Xingqing, and other 709 case lawyers and prisoners of conscience have their basic human rights in prison and make certain that they are not being tortured and are released to reunite with their families. I hope President Trump can meet with the family of the victims of, in the U.S. before his visit to China, talk about his attention to China's worsening religious freedom and human rights situation during his visit, and give the list of prisoners of conscience to the embassy. I believe this is also an important action to maintain universal values all over the world. Thank you, Wang Yanfang. Thank you so very much for your very moving statement. And I'd like to now yield uh, such time as you may consume to uh, Ms. Jin. Honorable Chairman Chris Smith, Honorable Subcommittee on on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations Representatives, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attention to my husband Zhang Tianyong's suffering. Jiang Tianyong is a lawyer. He has been working on the human rights for the past 张天勇 is a Chinese human rights lawyer. He began to advocate for human rights in 2006, representing hepatitis B patients, AIDS patients, and numerous Falun Gong practitioners. In order to promote the legal rights of lawyers, he contributed to the direct election of the Beijing Lawyers Association and exposed corruptions within the Beijing judicial system, such as blackmailing and racketeering. Uh, 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 被失踪两个月的讲述的录音作为证据呈交给国会。I am willing to provide the evidences, the photographic evidences of our heavy surveillance surrounding our house in China and also the audio recording of my husband when he, was, when he disappeared during the Jasmine Revolution. The rest, the rest of my testimony will be de de delivered by my translator. On October 29, 2009, Zhang Tianyong participated in a U.S. congressional hearing and spoke on the main theme, which was the problem with China's legal system and religion. As a result of his testimony, as a result of his testimony, at this time I am bearing witness to how the National Security Police retaliated against our entire family as a result of his testimony. Ever since, Tianyong was forced to stay home on sensitive dates, such as meetings of the National People's Congress, the Political Consultative Conference, June 4th, which is uh, the anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen Square Massacre, 
or during important political leaders' visits to China. He could only get out of the house by taking their police cars. I have videos to verify all of this. Beginning on February 15, 2011, Tianyong disappeared for two months during the Jasmine Revolution. He was brutally beaten, deprived of sleep, forced to watch CCTV news, sing songs, and recite patriotic articles to praise the Chinese Communist government, and write thousands of pages of repentance letters. The videos can serve as evidence. On May 3, 2012, five national security agents from Haidian District, Beijing, represented by Du Yuhui, beat Tianyong up when he attempted to visit the barefoot lawyer Chen Guangchen at the hospital. Tianyong temporarily lost his hearing due to the perforation of his left ear's tympanic membrane. The police repeatedly took Tianyong away for questioning and threatened him, saying that our child could not go to school if he refused to cooperate. They also said that I, was, that I as his wife, could be affected as well. The long-term harassment and threats consumed me. I even thought of suicide. My child's mental condition was severely disrupted. Desperate, I brought my daughter to the U.S. in May 2013. On March 20th, 2014, the local national security agents arrested Tian Yong again in Jin San Jiang, Heilongjiang, while he was representing Falun Gong practitioners. The police broke eight of Tian Yong's ribs during the 16 days of detention. I have the diagnosis from the hospital as proof. On November 21st, 2016, Zhang Tian Yong disappeared on his way back to Beijing after visiting the family members of lawyer Xie Yang. Now, the government has already banned him from meeting with lawyers for 178 days, and we do not know where he is detained. Tianyong's parents have been put under surveillance. The national security agents follow them wherever they go. According to the news on May 12, 2017, Tianyong has been tortured, and his legs are too swollen to walk. In order to safeguard human rights and the universal worth of defending legal rights, I strongly hope the Honorable President Trump and the U.S. Congress can immediately and effectively urge China's central government to investigate the actual facts behind the torture of those arrested in the, two, in the 709 crackdown, simultaneously enacting legal sanctions against those who practice torture, and request that China clearly ensures that other incarcerated prisoners of conscience do not continue to receive harm. In addition, I want to mention that Tianyong has already received a letter of confirming his political asylum in the United States. I hope that President Trump can negotiate with the Chinese government during his visit and let Tianyong reunite with me and my daughter. May 19th is Tianyong's 46th birthday. I hereby make a wish on behalf of Tianyong and our family. I hope he can regain freedom so his aging parents would not have to worry constantly and his daughter could have her wish fulfilled and embrace her father. I hope I can forever set aside my heart, which anxiously worries about Tianyong, and a tranquil and merry life can come to our household. Thank you. Jing Bianli. Jin, thank you so very much. I'd like to now yield to Ms. Lee. Jin的史密斯主席及诸位委员,午安。我是李明哲的太太李静怡。我衷心的感谢各位今天站出来members of the committee. Good afternoon. I am Li Jingyu, wife of Li Mingzhe. I would like to thank each of you for upholding and defending the values of freedom and democracy, values that human rights activists, including my husband, have dedicated their entire lives and energies to. I would also like to express my gratitude towards all the congressmen, especially Chairman Royce and Chairman Smith, who strive to maintain and further secure the implementation of the Taiwan Relations Act. 以下的证词将由思家小姐代我宣读。The rest of my testimony will be read directly by Jasmine Chashi. I'm deeply honored to be here today, alongside these three respectable women who have gone through such perilous situations for the cause of democracy and human rights. It's after hearing about their journeys that I realized how fortunate I am as a Taiwanese. I further understood the blessings of our democracy which exists today thanks to the support of the U.S. government. 
and all the 20th century Taiwanese human rights activists, as mentioned by Chairman Royce in the March 14, 2014 hearing on the TRA. My husband, Li Mingzhe, is from a is from a Chinese refugee family that immigrated to Taiwan following the nationalist government in 1949. His background and emotional connection to China have contributed to his support of Chinese human rights efforts. From 2012 until his disappearance, he gave online lectures through WeChat on the democratization of Taiwan and the history of the white terror period. He also managed and contributed to a social justice fund for the purpose of financially supporting Chinese political prisoners and their families experiencing economic hardship that stemmed from their support of the values of freedom, justice, and democracy. On March 19, 2017, while on an annual visit to China to meet with people he worked on the fund with, my husband was subjugated to enforced incommunicado detention. It's been 61 days since I last saw him. I'm concerned. I am concerned about his health, for he suffers from high blood pressure. I'm concerned for his safety. I do not know where he is, for the Guangdong government has refused to disclose the location of his detention. The deprivation of my husband's liberty by the local Guangdong government is arbitrary and transgresses the Articles 9, 19, and 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Cross-Strait Joint Crime Fighting and Judicial Mutual Assistance Agreement, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It was not long after my husband's enforced disappearance that I learned about his detainment from a middleman. Since current cross-strait relations are highly abnormal, many such cases that involve Taiwanese people being detained or arrested in China are settled through brokers. These brokers, for the most part, represent the interest of the PRC. I was shown a copy of a letter that was written under involuntary circumstances by my husband. This letter was in the hands of Li Junming, a representative of the PRC Taiwan Affairs Office. He threatened me, insisting that I cancel my trip to Beijing and also silence myself. Li expressed clearly that the detention originated as a result of the provincial government of Guangdong's desire to show its strict enforcement of the newly passed foreign NGO management law. He threatened that if I were to go to Beijing, the local Guangdong government would release a video of my husband admitting to having committed criminal actions. The U.S. has long insisted that its policy of no negotiation with terrorists is to be firmly followed. I also believe in that policy. I refuse to negotiate with a broker on such unequal grounds. If I did, it would be harmful and shameful to my family, my country, and my fellow human rights activists. Additionally, to my great disappointment, the Chinese government has unreasonably revoked my travel visa, even though I have clearly and calmly explained that I only wanted to travel to better understand the situation. China's position towards human rights and the rule of law is drastically different from that of Taiwan and other civilized democratic countries. China should not assume that their military and economic growth could, could force Taiwan to be annexed by it. If China maintains that my husband's actions of spreading the values of democracy and aiding the, family of aiding the family members of political prisoners can pose a threat to its national security, I believe the people of Taiwan will become not only more certain of their unwillingness to be annexed, but also hesitant to preserve a close relationship with China. It has only been around 20 years since Taiwan successfully overthrew the right terrorist one-party dictatorship so it is highly unlikely that we will be willing to accept another despotic government. I have no other choice but to come and stand before you, to ask for help from you. The United States of America is the leading democracy in the free world. It was built upon the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The U.S. has long been the protector of justice, freedom, and democracy everywhere. It, ha it has accepted the moral obligation to aid people deprived of their natural rights. The, Amer the American Congress's unwavering dedication towards these values has, influence has influenced many countries, including my home country, Taiwan, to embrace the spirit of human rights and democracy. The U.S. Congress also voluntarily taken res the responsibility as specified in Section 2, Clause 3 of the Taiwan Relations Act, 
to preserve and enhance the human rights of the people of Taiwan. Therefore, I stand alone before you today to plead for your help for my husband. I'm pleading the United States to continue to act as according to the TRA. I'm pleading the United States to continue to support the value of which it has always unbendingly defended. I'm pleading the United States to continue to uphold the values of which it was formed upon. I'm pleading the U.S. government to pressure, to pressure China to recognize the provincial government of Guangdong's illegitimate detention of my husband, Li Mingzhe, and free him. Thank you. Li Jing Leader. Ms. Li, thank you very much as well for your testimony. Um, finally, the Taiwan government is working behind the scenes to resolve the case of Li Ming Shi, although I'm sure such efforts are hindered by Taiwan's complicated diplomatic ties with Beijing. As I've said before, Taiwan is an important democratic ally and a beacon of peace and democracy in Asia. The U.S. should remain committed to the Taiwan Relations Act and the Six Assurances as the cornerstone of the U.S.-Taiwan relations. Political issues between China and Taiwan should be resolved through appropriate mechanisms between the two sides. The Chinese government's decision to detain Li Ming Shi uh, signaled Chinese officials' willingness to break its international human rights obligations for political gains, again, needlessly straining across uh, straight uh, ties. We do have a video, um, and I'd like to, uh, about a four minute video. Uh, it was sent to us uh, by the wives of lawyers of Li Hu Ping and Wang Quan Zhang. It features Wang Zhao Lin and Li. When Zhu and um, it will now uh, play for us.尊敬的史密斯主席七零九家属王俏玲我是李和平律师的妻子我的丈夫李和平律师在二零一七年四月二十八日被中国政府秘密审判被判颠覆国家罪名成立判有期徒刑三年缓刑四年那在二零一七年五月九日李和平律师回到
呃很严重的酷刑，就是戴一种叫做“工”字镣铐。那这种镣铐是在手铐和脚铐之间有一根铁链连接。当戴上这种镣铐之后，整个人就不能够完就不能够直立，四肢不能够伸展。这种镣铐他被迫戴了将近一个月的时间，每天二十四个小时，这让他。镣铐取下之后，他整个人都不能够直立起来，支起这个脊柱来行走。那在在这将近两年的过程当中，他被殴打，他被这样一个放在呃一个呃呃空调的冷冷风口当中，被这个冷风持续不断的二十四小时这样用冷风来吹他，吹了好几天。这种状况，这种折磨的手段是非常常见，而且他会被要求保持一个姿势，一天几几十个小十几个小时不能动。这都是他在这两年里面经历的。七零九案到现在已经是六百七十六天了。王全章是这当中唯一一个到现在音信全无的人，他没有在央视上出现过，没有被律师会见过，也没有与律师有过通信。只是有一位释放的律师曾说过，在秘密关押的期间，他们听到过王全章惨烈的呼叫声。嗯，随着七零九案陆续释放的人，嗯，他们所揭露的这个遭受酷刑的这个情况。我为王全章的生命安危万分担忧。我不知道他现在的身体状况是一个什么样子的，是不是因为酷刑身体残疾了，或者说这个人已经不在人世了，所以他们一直拒绝律师会见，害怕律师会见。嗯，七零九这些被释放的人，他们所披露的这些酷刑，让我担惊受怕，种种不好的猜测，让我寝食难安。所以在此。我盼望大家对王全章的这个生命安危，嗯，予以高度的关注。对，嗯，七零九案还在关押当中的江天勇律师、吴冠先生，持续的关注。谢谢大家，尊敬的史密斯主席，各位外交委员会全球。Thank you so very much for those insights, horrible and brutal as they are, concerning the torture. Let me ask a few questions, and then I'll yield to my colleagues for any questions they might have. And first of all, let me begin by saying to Ms. Jin、um, how heartbroken I and others are over your husband's incarceration. I will remind members of our committee、uh, that your husband、uh, testified on November 10th, 2009, at a hearing that I chaired.、Uh, he very much wanted to present testimony、uh, as a human rights lawyer. It was the Tom Lantos Commission, and I was chairing that hearing. And without objection, his testimony from that、uh, hearing will be made a part of this record as well.、Uh, but he was very firm, very clear、uh, in his testimony. He talked about working、uh, with、uh, Chen Quan Chen on behalf of women who had been subjected to the brutality of the one child per couple policy, a policy that treats women as chattel、uh, and forces them to kill. Kills their children, doesn't force them to kill it. Kills their babies,、uh, and and does so right up into the ninth month of pregnancy.、Uh, as we all know, under that brutal policy,、uh, there are now missing、uh, about 62 million females, a direct result of sex selection abortion, causing huge disparities in、uh, the male-female ratio.、Uh, but as you know, Ms. Jin, your husband bravely tried to defend the women. From this assault, and for that、uh, he was incarcerated. I would add to that that he returned to China, and this underscores something that has to come out of this hearing and all of our efforts going forward.、Uh, he went back to China.、Uh, President Obama was in Beijing. He asked and thought he had a meeting with him along with some of the other human rights lawyers. He did not,、uh, and. Hours after the president of the United States left on Air Force One, he was arrested, and his horrific ordeal that continues to this day continues.、Uh, that is, that is just it shows, in my opinion,、uh, that there is a consequence for being so brave, which is why we are all concerned about you and your husbands,、uh, and the fact that at the highest levels of government, and this appeal is to the president. Of the United States today, and the Vice President、uh, Mike Pence,、uh, that our voice has to be clear. We have to look Xi Jinping and other top leaders in the eye, have names, lists, the way Reagan did and did so effectively during the worst days of the Soviet Union,
uh, when there was always a list of dissidents and human rights activists and Jewish refuseniks that he would tender to uh, the leaders of the Soviet Union. Uh, and those people, not all, but many of them got out. And for many others, the torture was ameliorated because we paid attention to what was going on. I would also ask, add that we will ask President Trump. Uh, we will present him with your testimonies and Vice President Pence and ask him to meet with you. And I would add, we would ask him to meet with the five daughters as well and, and a few other uh, very notable human rights activists uh, who have suffered uh, for their convictions in China. We had five daughters here presenting testimony in 2013. We called it the Five Daughters Hearing. Uh, they all had a dad who was incarcerated and subjected to torture. We asked President Obama to meet with them so that when he met with Hu Jintao and after that Xi Jinping, he would have their cases and, and their pleas, their appeals, often through tears, uppermost in his mind to convey that agony to the leader of the Chinese government. Uh, we tried for months to arrange that meeting. At the end of about six months, we were told by the White House, he doesn't have the time. Now, if President Trump and Vice President Pence gives the same indifference, same answer, which I think is a callous disregard for suffering people, uh, I will be here at this podium speaking out against that uh, lack of, of concern and empathy uh, for suffering people. Uh, those young ladies said at that hearing, President Obama has two daughters. He'll understand what it's like for a daughter to speak on behalf of her father. You as wives are doing exactly the same. And I want you to know we, in this committee, both sides of the aisle, have nothing but concern and empathy for each and every one of you, for your husbands, for your families. And just a couple of very quick questions. When your husbands are incarcerated, and many of you spoke about this, Ms. Wong, uh, you spoke of uh, being severely damaged physically and mentally, health-wise, because of your husband's incarceration. The Chinese dictatorship knows that when they arrest your husbands or any dissident or prisoner of conscience, the whole family goes to jail. Uh, they know that the friends of the family of, of the incarcerated individual goes to jail as well. Uh, all the more reason why we need to significantly uh, up our voices, make our voices much clearer in Congress and at the White House, at the State Department, and added to that, we need to use the tools that are at our disposal from country of particular concern for religious believers, sanctioning the government of China for its egregious human rights violations on religious freedom, use the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and make them a tier three country, which they deserve to be for their complicity, the government's complicity in human trafficking, uh, which is, is bad and getting worse, and then for the political dissidents like your husbands who represent a cross-section of suffering individuals in China, including labor rights. There's no doubt that China does not respect ILO standards, International Labor Organization standards, uh, from collective bargaining uh, to even paying a decent wage. Uh, and with impunity, they crush independent trade union efforts we've had at our hearings in the past. Leaders of that movement come and testify and say, yeah, they have a, a labor union run by the government. It is a farce. So my question would be the impact on the families, um, and also um, if you would uh, speak to your hopes and expectations uh, of what we might do next. Again, I think you've said it in your testimonies. Implement our laws. We have a toolbox filled with a capacity to hold China to account Magnitsky is just the most, the latest iteration of a tool that can't stay in that toolbox. And the Chinese government must know, collectively as a government and individually, those who commit these crimes need to be held to account, and we have the tools to do it. So, um, yes. Ms. Wang. Chen,我觉得今天有个最新的消息就是他们国宝们压着谢阳回到我家里面,然后呢,他们告诉我的亲人需要我回国,如果我不回国的话,谢阳就没有自由。I uh, have a latest news uh, today, um, my uh, this public security officers um, 
threatened um, uh, uh, my husband and the family members that uh, if you, if I do not return to China, they will give uh, uh, him a heavier sentence. Uh, 所以呢，我觉得我在美国也是不安全的。我就首先请求美国来保护我和我的两个女儿的安全。So I feel even in the United States, uh, I don't feel safe. Uh, and um, if uh, I'm uh, we're I'm haunted, and uh, I really seek uh, uh, protection by the U.S. Would anybody else like to comment before I yield? Uh, to Mr. Castro, yes. Uh, 当然我还, uh, 这个还希望这个美国政府这边能够跟中国政府, um, 希望他们, uh, so I that call upon the U.S. government to, to uh, express to the Chinese government to stop the uh, this kind of uh, brutal persecution against uh, the uh, victims of the 709 cases and their family members and uh, to restore uh, their uh, dignity uh,因为他们是会有各种办法来否认当事人就是被关押的人他们的酷刑所以我提醒美国政府希望他们公布他们的这种被关押期间的录像因为他们是加入这个因为中国是加入这个联合国酷刑委员会的成员 uh, because the Chinese government is also a signatory country of uh, the anti-torture uh, uh, international covenant. So I uh, want uh, to call upon the Chinese government to, uh, government to reveal and release the videos uh, that uh, dur uh, during these uh, victims' incarceration and um, to show what they have uh, gone through. 因为我们七零九的这个小孩这个都不能上学，所以我希望这个呃川普总统也是有小孩的。我希望川普总统能够见见我们，同时他在中国之后能够见见这个七零九的家属以及这个被释放的这些律师律师们，呃，听听他们在
was uh, also uh, shared by other recently released uh, uh, human rights lawyers like uh, Li Chunfu, like uh, Li Shuyun, and of course Li Heping. Uh, and um, to the point, uh, attorney Li Chunfu uh, was uh, even tortured um, with uh, uh, serious uh, um, mental illness. Even last night, the Chinese official uh, uh, microblog, um, the Weibo, showed a, a short video clip. Uh, on that video, it uh, shows uh, my husband Jiang Tianyin was uh, kind of uh, uh, walking. Uh, and on that video, it claims that Jiang Tianyin was not tortured. But when I observed uh, that video, short video, I noticed uh, the, uh, on the uh, legs, both legs of Jiang Tianyong, um, the uh, kind of black and blue, were, uh, uh, the, the mark are still there on, on his legs. And uh, his face has uh, uh, been uh, uh, very uh, uh, swollen. And his right arm uh, cannot move when he walked. So I could not believe uh, that uh, what the government uh, uh, claimed that he was not tortured. So I was very concerned about Jiang Tianyong's life and safety. So I'm deeply concerned about uh, uh, what's happening uh, with Jiang Tianyong and his uh, well-being and his life. Uh, and even until uh, today, uh, he was denied uh, of uh, lawyer's visitation. So Jiang Tianyong in 2016 has received the U.S. Department of and uh, further, uh, Zhang Tianyong uh, has already been approved uh, as a U.S. Uh, uh, asylee, um, granted by the U.S. government in 2016 already. Uh, but the Chinese uh, regime uh, refused to let him uh, uh, exit from China. Uh, so I hope um, President, uh, President uh, Trump can um, really uh, express this point um, with the Chinese leaders. Uh, and uh, plead with the Chinese government uh, to uh, release uh, Jiang Tianyong and to um, have family reunion uh, here in the United States with ours. Uh, and today is uh, Jiang Tianyong's birthday. My daughter and I had been here for five, four years. Uh, we have, we, but we have never met again. Uh, My daughter is really, really eager to hug her daddy. Thank you. Mr. Castro. Uh, I know, I think they just called votes, and so uh, I want to say thank you to each of you for your courage and your bravery in coming here to Congress and telling us your stories. I hope that you'll continue to give us counsel and guidance on how you believe the United States can be more helpful as it comes to China and the issue of human rights. And we, in turn, will monitor not only your situations and the situations of your husbands, uh, but also of others who are going through similar things in China. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this should be an effort not only for the United States, but also for the allies of the United States around the world. So 
your suggestions on how you believe that the friends of the United States, those nations who also believe in strong human rights, can be helpful with respect to China and ensuring that China is a place that respects the human rights of its people and the freedoms of its people. Thank you for being here. Mr. Castro, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's troubling as I review the remarks of the ladies here today and consider uh, that not only were the victims of the 709 crackdown um, jailed and subsequently tortured uh, because they were brave enough to take a stand in favor of human rights, but that in fact it would appear that a meeting planned with the United States President may have been a pretext for an arrest of other individuals in China. As a member of this committee, I understand that when we hold hearings such as this, it's our responsibility to try to work to help people. But it is my fear that your courage in being here might be used as a pretext again to hurt people. With that said, I understand that as one member of 435 and one of two chambers of a legislative body, there is only so much that I can do, but I want to be abundantly clear for the record and for these brave women. To the extent that I have the ability to cast a vote that will deal favorably or unfavorably with the regime uh, based on how it treats its own citizens and people who seek to affect positive human rights changes, I will consider their actions when I make my vote. To the extent that I have the ability to put forward policy that will shape the United States policy as it relates to nations based on how they treat their citizens and other citizens, I will consider these things and how I advance policy. And to the extent I am able to influence my colleagues and the, and the executive branch of this government as it relates to relations with foreign nations to include dominant global forces such as the People's Republic of China, I will consider how they treat their people and other people as it relates to human rights when I seek to exert that influence. We shouldn't convene committee hearings to help people that we know have the potential to lead to greater harm to people without ensuring the folks that we seek to help, you all, that we'll do everything in our power to make sure that all we can affect that is good is affected. With that, I offer my admiration and my thanks for the courage of these ladies, my encouragement for people who in China, as everywhere, seek basic human rights as outlined in foundational American documents, documents life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but as aspired to by people across the globe, and promise that within my small ability to make a difference, I will side with human rights and with people who have suffered like yourselves wherever possible. And I appreciate the chairman for creating this opportunity, and I commend your courage, and to the extent it's appropriate, you have my prayers and my promise to do what I can. Mr. Garrett, thank you very much uh, for that very strong statement, and, and you're right. They all have our prayers as well as everything we can do as a committee in a bipartisan way and as a Congress uh, to assist your husbands and the other lawyers. Uh, I remember years ago on a Northern Irish hearing, we had a, uh, a woman whose husband was murdered, a human rights lawyer named Patrick Finucane, uh, and the bottom line was that by killing and hurting lawyers who are really one of the last protections that citizens have to exercise due process rights and to get their case to resolve grievances. Uh, the Chinese government is going, for the, is going for the juggler with this. And I think all of us in the Western countries need to realize that our voices have to be raised higher and louder and more effectively than ever before. And as I said before, every tool that we have in our toolbox needs to be deployed on behalf of your husbands. If the lawyers um, are silenced, where does any aggrieved party go for help? Uh, even in a flawed uh, rule of law country like China, there was still, as your husbands did, uh, 
you effectuated change. They spoke on behalf of victims and in some cases got durable remedies. So I want to pledge to you that we will all continue. We will make that request of the, uh, the Trump administration uh, that you meet with him and with the vice president. Uh, and um, we will do that immediately by way of letter and by way of phone calls and visits uh, because he needs to look you in the eyes so that when he looks Xi Jinping in the eyes, uh, he has your, your husband and your um, uh, interests right there front and center. So I, if there's anything you would like to add in terms of that we might have missed, um, this is your opportunity before we run over to vote. Is the vote on now? Oh, okay. If you could. Uh, Thank you. We're joined by uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair Chairman Mark Meadows. But if there's anything that you would like to add before we conclude. Yes, Ms. Wang. Uh, 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 I would like to add on to uh, what we hope the U.S. government will be doing. Uh, uh, my uh, husband, uh, Mr. Tang Jingling, uh, was not uh, participating in anything illegal. Uh, this is, this is the world uh, these are recognized by both the international community as well as China. Although he is uh, sentenced to five years, I hope that he could be released. Uh, Mr. Tang was uh, incarcerated uh, due to his participant, uh, participation in uh, nonviolent uh, civil disobedience, and that resulted in his mother's death. Uh, I hope he could uh, come home and visit his elderly father. Uh, I hope the U.S. would uh, put extra um, emphasis and uh, more uh, just follow these situations of uh, human rights victims or political prisoners uh, and their families who are being uh, persecuted. Uh, because these actions are a violation of human rights, we hope that the U.S. government will bring uh, these concerns to the Chinese government. The, torture, the torturing of all the incarcerated pers uh, people uh, should, uh, should stop. Uh, they should also stop the persecution against their families, lawyers, and their children. Uh, they should also stop their persecution against Christians, uh, Buddhists, Falun Gong, or other uh, religious groups. Uh, uh, thirdly, I'd like to request that the ambassador to uh, China and Beijing would meet with these victims and families of these victims. I would also uh, like to ask that before President Trump meets uh, President Xi, he would also meet with the families of these victims who, are, who reside in the U.S. Thank you very much. My husband's incidents has caused uh, a panic among uh, Taiwanese NGO workers. I hope the United States could uh, strongly pay attention to my husband's incident. Because uh, this, because uh, all NGO workers 
around the globe might face the same situation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, without objection, a letter signed by several scores, uh, I think it was about 40 scholars um, on behalf of your husband, uh, will be made a part of the record. It includes a very diverse group of people, including the former chief of staff for one of our colleagues, Senator Claiborne Pell. Um, and without objection, this will be made a part of the record. Yes. Anybody else uh, before we close? And, and Mark, would you want to? Ms. Chin. Uh,我还有一个就是要小小的要求，就是呃，我希望呃，美国政府呃和中国呃政府交涉，就是要调查这个七零九事件被灌药的这个事情。I have another small request. Um, I hope uh, the uh, U.S. government, U.S. U.S. government can raise this issue to the to ask the Chinese government to launch an independent investigation on the uh, torture against uh, the. Uh, um, the lawyers in the 709 cases, and being and especially the, the, the torture uh, method of uh, uh, drug being drugged. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to yield to my good friend and colleague, Mr. Meadows. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you one once again for being a voice for so many people who. Uh, don't have a voice. I mean, there is one person out of 435 members that is a champion, and, and that's not to be disrespectful of my colleague. I think he would recognize that there uh, is a champion who always wants to make sure that he reaches out, and, uh, and you're recognized that, but both Democrats and Republicans, and I, and I just want to say thank you. But for each one of you, I want to also uh, say that uh, with my colleague uh, opposite uh, from a Democrat perspective, but also on the Republican side, that we will work in a bipartisan way to address these atrocities and these human rights violations. And I can assure you, at the very highest levels uh, of our government, they will be made aware of uh, the personal tragedy that you've had to endure and uh, and so I just I just wanted to say that for the record that your testimony here today is meaningful and it will be shared uh, in the appropriate way and uh, Mr. Chairman I yield back. Mr. Meadows, thank you very much and uh, I really appreciate your work on behalf of human rights that's been long-standing and particularly as a member of this committee. Thank you. Uh, the hearing is adjourned and I thank you all very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>